Come on, give him your New Year's praise. Come on, let him hear you loud and proud. Hey, and while we're putting our hands together, let's welcome our online community that watch faithfully. Come on, City Church. And high five the best looking neighbor this morning and tell them Happy New Year. It's going to be a good year. It's going to be a good year. Come on, I love it. I love the new year. How many of you just enjoy uh, a new year? Five people. Well, let me, let me just... Let me just say this, a new year gives you an opportunity to experience something new and something better. Man, that's a gift from God. We get a, get a reset, we can refocus and refresh in whatever area that it is. And the reality is, is that uh, the reason I fast and pray at the beginning of the year, let me just say that this, is because I, I want to hear God's voice clearly concerning my new year. And sometimes in order to hear You've got to shut some things up. You, you got, there's some competing voices. How, how many of you know Oreos will be speaking to your pastor? Like the golden stuff, my God. Get from behind me, Satan. I, I don't need to hear like from Oreo. I need to hear from God. And so anytime you put, <laughs> anytime you put God first, no matter if it's in your marriage, in your relationship, in your finances, and at the first of the year, how many of you realize it's going to be gooder? Let's tell your neighbor, it's going to be gooder. It's going to be gooder. <laughs> and so that's what we do. And I implore you. I don't know what that looks like for you. But seek God. Put God first. And I guarantee you, you can experience amazing, amazing things. And when it comes to experiencing new, can I just say this? Your unwillingness to leave the old will always always, always keep you from experiencing the new. It's an unwillingness to leave the old. It's not maybe or might. It will always keep you from experiencing new. So whatever new thing that you want to experience in, in 2024, I don't even know, it's going to take some new decision, new direction. You, you've got new wine. How many of you realize Jesus said you need new wine skin? Because you can't put it in an old way of doing things and expect the results that you desire. And so as we kick off, how many of you enjoyed the Unite service Wednesday night? Who, who? Yeah, y'all learned that pastor got a little bit of Daniel son in him. If you don't know, you don't know. But if you do, you do. Uh, and so we kicked off our first of the year series, Fresh Start. I believe that each and every one of us have the opportunity to start fresh at the first of the year. And I want to give you some strategies that's going to help you uh, be successful throughout uh, the year. And so if you got your Bible, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 5. We'll be in verses 1 through 11. And when it's on the screen and you're ready to receive, say, go with it, Pastor. One day as Jesus was preaching on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, a great crowd pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two, somebody say two, two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them, and they were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat, and he taught the crowd from there. And when he was finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now go out where it is deep and let down your nets to catch some fish. How many of you realize that sometimes it ain't just about doing a new thing? It's about maybe revisiting an old thing and just inviting Jesus into it? Come on, somebody. And getting different results. He said, Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, man, I, I, I just dare somebody in 2024 to get it. if you said so type of attitude when it comes to the things of God, when it comes to the word of God. Peter's like, I don't, I don't quite understand it, but if you say so, I'll let down my nets again. And this time their nets were so full, and the fish, they begin to tear, and shouting for help brought their partners in the other boat, and as soon as the other boats were filled and the fish with the fish, and they were on the verge of sinking, when si Simon Peter realized what had happened, and he fell to his knees before Jesus, said, oh, Lord, please, just, just leave me. I'm such a sinful man, for he was awestruck. Oh, wouldn't that be awesome to have an awestruck type of year? He was awestruck by the number of fish that they had caught, as were the others with him. His partners, James and John, and sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. And 
Jesus replied to Simon, hey, 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 don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they had landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. Come on, look at your neighbor this morning and inform them that you've got some decisions to make. Hopefully, hopefully you're not married and it gets a little attention, but I've got some decisions to make. Can we talk about it for a little bit? Shout amen if we can. Amen. Yeah, how many of you remember being like young, a kid, like real, real like a kid? How many of you remember being, uh, being a kid? Amen. Yeah, some of you are like, I got a file in the Rolodex way back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, I, I remember being a, a kid and, you know, being a kid is all about, you know, desire. And we would romanticize and fantasize as young kids to have the power to decide, right? You want the power to choose, when it comes to your outfit, right? Like, I don't care. I, I want to wear, wear my camo pants with my plaid polo shirt. I don't care if it don't match. I want to wear it. I want to decide. Why do I have to go to bed so early? I want to stay, stay up late. Why can't I watch this? And so when you're young, you're a kid, you, you fantasize and you dream about the day when you get older And the day that you get older, you can actually have the power to decide. Like you want to choose. When you're a young teenager, you you want to be able to decide where you go and when you go. You can't, you dream about the day that you turn 16. You don't realize just because you get a car, you don't, that doesn't mean you get to do whatever you want to, isn't that right, parents? Because when you're young, mom and dad, we have to, we have to decide for our kids because our kids, they're not ready to decide you know they, they're the craziest thing listen you've got to tell them to brush their teeth you got to tell them what to, you, you gotta you gotta lead them but as a kid you you fantasize about the day that comes when you're able to make a choice when you're able to decide now as an adult come on where are my adults at we we just dream about being a kid Because we don't want to decide nothing. (laughs) See, when you're a kid, you're like, man, I get to decide. And as an adult, you're like, man, I got to decide, man. And we we realize, like, in in our immaturity, we think the power to decide brings freedom. But also, when we mature, we realize that the power to decide also brings a level of frustration. And Cornell University said that the average person makes about 35,000 decisions a day that's a lot of decisions that's a lot of weight that's a lot of responsibility because at the end of the day I think many of us many of us when it comes to deciding and and making decisions and making choices we can uh, lay in bed at night and we can think man did I make the right choice or is this the wrong choice is should I do this or should I do that and when it comes to the power of deciding it can bring a lot of anxiety it can bring a lot of, of worry. And this is what Jesus said about life. Therefore, do not worry. Don't worry about what you, like, don't worry about the choice. Like, don't, don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear. And how many of you realize, man, that's easier said than done, isn't it, parents? Like, I, try, I strive to find that place. And the truth is, is that in life, we can be weighed down with the responsibility of choices of decisions. 35, 35,000. I was shocked. I was shocked. That's a lot. That's a lot of things that we got to decide. And out of that 35,000, 226.7 are about food. <laughs> I wasn't exactly sure how they got the point seven. I don't know how you make a point seven uh, partial decision, like 20. 226.7, how, how do you get a point, how do you get a point seven, point seven uh, of, of a decision? And in my lightning sharp mind, I thought, well, here it is. Um, uh, why, what do you want to eat after, um, after church today? That's where the point seven, like, husbands, you know, when you ask your wife, what, what do you, what do you want to eat? And they're like, I don't know. And then you name this restaurant and that restaurant and this one. And it's like, um, yeah, uh, no, yeah, uh, yeah, that, no, nah, I really don't want that. And, and, and that's where the point seven comes from, guys. Decisions, choices. 
And this is what I know concerning your life, that if you want something different, you're going to have to choose differently. You have to decide differently. And choice anxiety is a real thing. And sometimes we don't make any choice, and that's a choice within itself because we're paralyzed with fear. And we see in our text today that Peter, Peter had to make some choices that day in Luke chapter 5. And I want to unpack some of the choices that Peter made uh, that day in Luke 5 that were life-altering because uh, he had to make some decisions. And the first one what we see happened at the end of the encounter that Peter had with Jesus in verse 11. It says, as soon as they had landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. How many of you know leaving everything, that's a, that's a big decision? That's a, that's a huge, that's a big decision. I think sometimes we can underestimate or overestimate the power of big decisions. Because let's think about it. Leaving your livelihood leaving your job, leaving your career, leaving everything you knew, like to follow Jesus, we would all agree that that's big. This is a huge, huge decision that Peter made, life-altering. He doesn't know how it's going to end up. All I know is that Peter made a big decision to leave what was comfortable, to leave what was familiar, to leave how he made a living, to leave his career, how many of you realize Peter was married? You know what Peter needs? Peter needs the relationship series next month that's called Right Between Us because he, like with big decision people, come on, you need, you need to check with your spouse from time, like that's a big decision. And I could just imagine, I could just imagine how that day went, you know, Peter coming home talking to Mrs. Peter. She's probably like, well, hey, how, how, did it, how did it go? How did it go? And she was used to Peter not catching fish. And you realize that, right? Peter was not very good at his job. I mean, all I have is scripture to go off of. And every time Peter's fishing without Jesus, how many of you know, Peter's not catching anything. So I'm assuming he's average at best and probably a little below average, and so I don't know how, I don't know how, I don't know how this conversation would have went with Peter's wife when he got home. And she said, well, how did it go today? Expecting the same results. Well, I didn't catch that much. Nets broke. But no, this day was different. This day was completely different. He walks in and, and she asks, well, how did it go? She's probably expecting the typical same response about, you know, nets being broke or the one that got away. Come on, guys. You know, you know the one that got away. It was really the bottom of the lake. You didn't have nothing. It just broke your line. But, yeah, she's probably expecting about the consistent same results as Peter, like average, average fisherman, average, below average, but not this day. This day, she, he probably came in and the conversation went a lot different. She asked, how'd it go? And he's like, babe, let me tell you, let me tell you, let me tell you what happened. What happened was, is I was just washing my net. I, I was fishing and I didn't, I, didn't catch, I didn't catch anything. She's probably like, yeah, like before. But I, I, this time I'm just washing and this man named Jesus. Jesus, he come walking up, he's teaching. There's crowds everywhere. I'm just washing my net, minding my own business. I, I, I'm just, just washing. And, and this man named Jesus asked, hey, can I, can I use your boat? Man, sure, here, here, here it is. And he gets in the boat, and he's teaching, but I'm washing my nets. I'm not really paying attention a little bit, but just washing my net, doing my own thing. He's teaching, 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 washing net, teaching, washing, teaching, washing. He gets done, he gets done. And then he tells me, he tells me, hey, why don't you just cast out in the deep and let your nets down for a catch? And I'm sitting here thinking this time, uh, this time I'm the fisherman here. Like, you don't fish during the day. You keep the preaching. I'll keep the fishing. I know. I know. Stay in your lane, bro. Stay in your lane. You're going to get up in my business. But you know what? I, I had to start. What could it hurt? And so, babe, I, I, can you believe that all those fish are right there by the dock? That's been the whole problem. That I pushed, I pushed out and I let my net down. Ooh, I couldn't believe it. I thought it was stuck on the bottom. You remember how big our nets are? You remember that one time when you came to help me wash and mend it, and, and you, you don't ever do that anymore because we don't work well together. You just stay in your lane, and I stay in mine. 
You know how big those nets are? I thought I had the bottom. I was, and then all of a sudden, I felt the net. I felt the net. I felt it moving. I was like, oh, my God. We got, we got the load of all mother loads. And I began to pull up. I began to pull up. And I could not believe it. There was so many fish in my net, it began to tear. You know what I had to do? I was fearful. I didn't want to do it, but I had to do it. I didn't want to do it, but I had to do it. I seen James and John, they weren't doing anything. But to save the catch, I had to call them over. And it filled their net. And he goes, there was so many fish. It was like the best day ever. And Peter's wife's probably going, oh, my God, thank you, Jesus. I've been waiting on this forever. God, finally, finally. He said, there were so many fish. The boat began to sink. We got him to the shore. She's like, yeah. You know what I did? She's like, what? She goes, I, I quit. You quit? What do you mean you, you quit? You quit? Well, kind of, sort of, kind of, kind of, sort of. I mean, I'm still a fisherman. I just... I just, it's, it's hard to explain. It's, it's, it's really hard to explain. I just, I'm fishing for something different. She's probably like, oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. At least he's still a, a, a fisherman. And at this time, Peter's wife probably, he's thinking about the debt she's going to pay off. Like, oh, my God, I'm going to pay off credit card. I'm going to pay off debt. I'm going to get that new donkey because that old donkey can't carry nothing. In it. I'm going to get a new wardrobe. I'm going to have an addition so Peter can get all his fishing stuff out of my house. Thinking about all these things. And then Peter, it's like, yeah, greatest day ever, ever. And what does he do? He quits. He quits. And she's like, you just love everything? You love the fish and the boat? You left it to rot and ruin? Yeah, yeah. Really? Uh, yeah. Because if you're going to quit, right, you, if you're going to quit, you don't quit in verse 11, right? You don't quit. You, you quit when your net's empty. That's when you quit. You quit when it's empty. Like I've been working. I've been toiling all night. If you're going to walk away with, from something, you don't walk away when it works. You walk away when the nets are empty. You walk away when it doesn't produce. You, work at, you walk away whenever, you know, the evaluation reviews coming up on your sales and you know that they're low and you just walk in and you're like, I quit. You can't fire me because I quit. You don't quit when the nets are filled. If you're going to quit, it makes sense to quit when it doesn't work. But Peter quits while it's working. It's a big decision. This is a life-altering decision. This is a world-changing decision. And Peter doesn't make this decision when his nets are empty. He makes this decision when his nets are filled. You know, if you were to survey or take a vote with all the other fishermen that are there, this is a fishing community. you got boats and fishermen. If you were to take a vote, on what Peter should do, can I tell you the popular opinion would not be to quit in the middle and the height of success. That's why when it comes to decisions, you can't vote and let everybody vote in your life what you should do. Like, it's not going to be the popular decision. To leave and to follow Jesus on top, like with all that success, with all that fish, that is not going to be the popular opinion. It's not going to be the popular choice. But you cannot take a vote from everyone to decide your future. Peter just got to a place that he made a decision, but he didn't make it alone. How many of you know James and John was with him? You need wisdom. Come on, you need counsel. When it comes to making big decisions, I'm not saying you just get out there as a Lone Ranger Christian and you just sell everything, leave everything. I am saying you need wisdom and you need counsel, but you don't need everyone's opinion. Because the big decision that you're going to make in your life isn't always going to be the popular decision. And all, like, how many of you realize that wasn't the last time Peter fished? It wasn't the last time. He went, John chapter 21, he went fishing again. He went fishing. I'm sure he ate fish. I know there was one time he had to pay some taxes, and Jesus said, hey, go fit. Like, there's a gold coin in, in the mouth of a fish. 
And here's the truth. It will never be the popular opinion, come on, to make a decision to get your priorities in order. Because that's all that Peter did. He prioritized. He prioritized Jesus over fishing. One of the biggest decisions that you can make in your new year is to put a priority on the things of God. One of the biggest, biggest decisions that you can make with your life is getting your priorities in order. And let me just say this. When you put God first and you seek his kingdom and his righteousness, all these other things that you've been chasing, that you've been valuing, that you're spending time, effort, energy, and money on, can I tell you, all these things Jesus will add unto you. All the power, the big decision of priority. Is it gold or is it God? Is it profit or is it presence? Is it success or is it a savior? It's not a matter of you not having some things, but it is a matter of those things not having you. The power to decide, and that's what Peter did. He said, I'm going to prioritize Jesus over Jesus over everything. But how many of you realize that all a big decision, like that's verse 11, and Jesus, like, he didn't just immediately, Peter didn't just immediately start out forsaking and leaving everything. Because our big decisions in life is a series of, the second one is small decisions. Come on, you just don't meet someone and say, oh, I mean, you might, but, like, we're going to get married. No, 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 that's a series of small decisions leading up to the big one. You know, having kids, a series of small decisions leading up to the big one. And Jesus just doesn't come. He doesn't just come to Peter and say, okay, all right, like you're going to leave everything. No, 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 no. Before Peter leaves everything, Peter was willing to do a small thing. And we see in verse 3 that Jesus, he stepped into one of the boats and he asked Simon, the owner, to push it out into the water. And so he sat in the boat and taught from the crowd. And so let me, let me just show you, before Peter left everything, he was willing to push a little thing. I think a lot of times we overestimate the power, uh, underestimate the power of, of small decisions. Come on, the small decisions that you make can create momentum in your life that can make a huge difference. Let me just say this. Peter did not know what was on the other side of that push. He did not understand that God was going to use him in a major capacity. He was willing to push in the shallows long before he ever experienced the fullness of his nets. Can you, steward, can you push in the shallow because this is what we want to do we want to go from shore to net or shore to deep from shore to nets being filled but there is a process can you push in the shallow you don't realize the power and the significance and the small decisions that you make it creates a massive momentum in your life you don't know peter didn't know he didn't know what was on the other side of just push You don't know what's on the other side of you just joining a small group. You don't know what's on the other side of just joining a serve team. You don't know what's on the other side of the small and what you interpret as an insignificant decision. But it carries great strength and it carries great power and it carries great momentum in your life. Can you push in the shallow? Because every net that is filled comes from somebody who is willing to push in the shallow. See, it's the things that nobody sees that lead to the results that everyone wants. Can you, can you, can you, can you push? You don't know. Peter didn't know. You don't know. You don't know what's on the other side of it. Small, small decisions. No one sees it leads to big results that everyone wants. You don't know. You don't know. See, I didn't start out in the pulpit. I started out in the pews. I didn't know. I was just willing to get chairs straight. Behind every successful business, behind every successful 
marriage, behind every success. There was a stewardship in the shallow. There was a, a push. My wife didn't know that night. You didn't know. You didn't know that night when I laid there in a drunken stupor. You didn't know. Smelling God awful. You didn't know. All you knew was I was a broken man. You didn't know. You didn't know. You didn't see all this. You didn't know when you reached over and you laid hands on me and you asked God, please show him he still has something worth living for. You didn't know. Didn't know. Little, a little push. I'll tell you, it wasn't the devil that motivated you to do that. She didn't know. I didn't know. We didn't know. I didn't even know she laid hands on me. All I knew is when I woke up that next morning, my head hurt. <laughs> it hurt. But I did ask this. She'll tell you. I was like, babe, we got a Bible? She was like, <laughs> put. She didn't know. You don't know. Peter didn't know that on the other side of a little push, we don't know. We don't know the, the big moments that the small moments lead to. It creates a massive amount of momentum, either good or bad, either positive or negative. Come on, nobody just wakes up addicted. It's a series of very significant and powerful choices that we underestimate the power and the momentum of. Nobody, nobody just wakes up addicted. It's the little foxes that can spoil the vine. It's the little leaven that leavens the lump. Can I say it the way I got it written in my notes? Are we, are we, grown, we grown folk here? Say, say it. Nobody just starts out in the crack house. It's the series of little choices that creates momentum. And you find yourself, how did I get here? How did this happen? One small decision at a time. Nobody just falls in adultery. Baby, I was walking down the road and you wouldn't believe what happened. I tripped and I fell right into it. It don't happen that way. It's a series of small decisions. Oh, it's just a DM. It's just a conversation. Oh, we're just connecting. It's a series. You know, one of the darkest, most horrific moments in the life of King David. King David had a lot of victories, but he also had some very, very bad defeats. And one of the darkest seasons in David's life, it started out in 2 Samuel chapter 11. And it started out in verse 1. It says, in the year and at the time when what go to battle? Ah, kings go out to battle. That David sent Joab and his servant with him and all of Israel. And they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabah. But David remained. Where did he remain? He's at Jerusalem. Next verse. Then it happened one evening that David rose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. It's not Peep and Tom, it's Peep and David. He was the original. And the woman was beautiful to behold. Now, that woman is Bathsheba. And if you know the story of David and the downfall and the pitfall and the most horrific thing that ever happened was here David was. He committed adultery with another man's wife, gets her pregnant. It just gets worse. Then he has... The husband, Uriah, come because he wants her to, to be intimate with his wife. But Uriah is full of character and full of integrity. He refuses to dishonor his soldiers by living in pleasure and comfort while they battle. And so he sleeps right in front of the door of the palace. He refuses. He's such a man of character, such a man of integrity. He refuses to do it. And so what does David do? David pins a death sentence on Uriah. And he's full of character. 
He's full of integrity. He doesn't, he doesn't look. He doesn't, doesn't question it. And Uriah goes back to the most fiercest, hardest fighting that is there on the battlefield. People withdrew, and Uriah is dead. All because David, all because David had done this thing with his wife, with Uriah's wife. Horrible. Where did it start? It started right here in verse 1. David was not where he was, should have been and where he's supposed to have been. Oh, it was just a little thing. Just a little decision. And the time that kings went to war, well, the king wasn't at war. The king was at the palace in Jerusalem because we can underestimate the significance and the power and the momentum that small decisions create in our life, whether good or bad. That's why I say it's a one-year challenge, man. Jump in there. Get in a small group. Join a team. Get in a devotional plan. Connect. I'm telling you, if you're not changed, if you're not different, by the end of the year, when you jump on the one-year plan, we'll, go, we'll quit church together and go fishing on Sundays. I'm done. Why am, why am I doing this? I'm telling you, the small decisions that lead and yield big results. Or how about this, the bad ones? What about the bad, bad decisions? Because Peter, how many of you know Peter made some bad decisions? I call them dumb decisions. I mean, Matthew 16, you know, Jesus said, who do people say that I am? And some say Elijah. And, and Peter, Peter has this revelation that's revealed to him by God that Jesus is the son of, son of God. He's the Christ. He's the Messiah. It's awesome. Great choice. Great decision. And then when Jesus begins to, to declare the plan and the purpose of the cross and dying and and. Peter's like, God forbid that would happen. How many of you know deciding to try to stop the plan and the purpose of God <laughs> is not a good decision? It's a dumb decision. And what did Jesus do? He rebuked him and said, get behind me, Satan. He's like, boy, you dumb. Stop. This ain't going to work. Or how, how about this? Whenever, whenever Peter decided he was going to try to cut the head off of Malchus, in the gospel of, of John, the high priest soldiers come to take Jesus. And, you know, here Peter is. He's pulling his sword, defending. And how many of you realize God don't need you defending him? He can speak a word and legions of angels, host of a heavenly army. I, like Peter, he's like, boy, you dumb. Put that sword away. There's, you know, you live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. Come on, man. man. You be being like, no, nah, I don't need your help. I got this, Peter. Dumb. Like, it's a bad decision. Or how about this? When Jesus declares that all is going to forsake him and abandon him, and then Peter's, Peter's over here like, they might do that, Lord, but I'll never, I'll never forsake you. I'll even go to prison for you. And Jesus is like, boy, you stupid. Before this night's over, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. Dumb. Like, we all make bad decisions. You make bad decisions. I make bad decisions. Peter makes bad decisions. Even after the death of Jesus, what did Peter do? Peter says, I'm going fishing. Boy, that's dumb. Jesus already pulled you out of that. Why would you go back to the very thing that he, got, he, did, like, he pulled you out of? Bad, bad decisions. John 21, but if you turn right to the book of Acts, chapter 1, chapter 2, day of Pentecost, who's preaching? Peter. Peter is declaring the word of God. He's preaching the word of God. And in that day, 3,000 got saved. It was almost like he took a net and threw it, and he caught all these people. And the early church was birthed and born. And Peter... The one who made big decisions, small decisions, bad decisions, was the one that God used. Because God can work through it all. He can work through the dumb and the denial of Peter. Decisions, choices. But see, we didn't even go over the most important decision that was made in Luke chapter 5. The most important decision was, the text says, he, who's he? Jesus. Who's Jesus? God. Notice how many boats? 
How many boats? So he's got to make a decision to empty boats at the water's edge. See, the most important and the most powerful decision that was made that day wasn't Peter's big decision and it wasn't Peter's bad decision. It was God's decision to step into Peter's boat. And the most powerful decision that is made in our life is when God decides to step in our boat. Because there was two boats there. And so God had to decide. And let me just say this. God decides different than we do. You know how we learn to decide? You ready for it? Here it goes. This is how we learn to decide. Any minute, money, mo, catch a tiger by his toe. If he hollers, let him go. My mama told me to pick the very best one, and you aren't it, Peter. That's how we choose, but not how God chooses. God chooses this way. Say, go with it, Pastor. Any minute, money, mo, catch a tiger by his toe. If he hollers, let him go. My father told me to pick the very worst one. And you are it, Peter. God chooses different. He uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He uses the base things. He don't choose like we choose. Oh, the gospel The gospel isn't about you deciding. It's about God decided a long time ago that he's seen your brokenness. He's seen your flaws. He's seen your failures. He's seen your faults. And not because of you, but in spite of you, he was still willing by his love and by his grace to step into your empty vessel. That is the greatest and most powerful decision that was ever made is when God stepped in your boat not because you're good but because he's good and the gospel of Jesus Christ in the cross of Calvary is God looked down and seen a a planet filled with empty vessels and he said I refuse to waste the untapped potential that I see down there I see empty vessels and I will not stand for it I will become a man and I will dwell among them and I will step into their emptiness and I will step into their brokenness not because they're good but because I'm good and that I see it and when you start seeing the gospel For what it is, you can't help but to respond in love. You can't help but be like Peter and say, Lord, get away from me. I'm just a sinful man. It demands worship. It demands surrender. It demands a response like that because you start realizing it's the goodness of God that brings one to repentance. It's not in my do-goodism. It isn't in my ability to fill my own nets. It's in my ability to surrender and get to a place that says, if you say so, I don't understand. I don't know. I don't know why you're so good. I don't know why you love me. I don't know why you want to step into my boat. But that is the gospel, my friends. And if I could help you to see anything clearly in 2024, it would be to see God for who he is, to know him, to find freedom, to discover purpose. So just like Peter, you can make a difference. And the gospel didn't start with you, and it won't end with you. How many of you realize it wasn't Peter's big decision that got it started, so it can't be his bad decision that's going to stop it? It was God deciding to step into the brokenness of your life. It was God on the shores of your life seeing that empty spot. Oh, you've got some decisions to make. But before you make decisions, I want you to know the most important one in your life has already been made. And it's the one that God decided for. He is the author and the finisher of your faith. He is the alpha and the omega. He is the beginning and the end. You didn't start it, so you don't have the authority to end it. He started the story and he decides where to end, put the period in your life. That's the gospel. And if it's never been presented to you like that, maybe you've come from a religious background to 
You think you've got to jump through hoops. You think you've got to do, nah, it's just in the surrender. It's allowing God to step into your life and into your boat. That, my friends, will be the most success that you experience on planet Earth. It's when God that loves you and died for you and bled for you and wants to do life with you steps into your life because he loves you. Would you stand with me all over this place? Hey, can we put our hands together for Jesus? If you're here today, man, and you want to experience greater, if you want to experience all that God has for you in 2024, I want to pray with you in this moment. I want you to stretch your hands to heaven as a sign of surrender. Like I'm not holding anything back. I want to receive I want to receive God's best for 2024. How many of you know you can't, you can't receive with a closed hand? Like, you've got to let some things go. There's some, there's some things that you need to let go that would happen back in 2023 or 2022. There's some things that happened 10 or 15 years ago that you're still trying to drag in, drag into a new year. Let me say this, your unwillingness to walk away from the old will always keep you from experiencing the new. And we want to experience new. God still is the God that does exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask or think. So Father, I thank you as we start this new year off, God, as we seek you and put you first in all things, we release those things that would hold us back and we open our lives and we open our hearts to receive all that you have done and all that you have for us. Lord, fill the broken areas, fill the empty areas. God, let your spirit empower us to be and to do all that you've called us to do. Give us strength during these 21 days of fasting and prayer to shut down the competing voices of culture that we may lean our ear and tune our ear to the king and the kingdom and his frequency and his voice because he is a great shepherd. He is the great I am, Jehovah Jireh, El Shaddai. You are more than enough, God, and we surrender and we submit to the Lordship. God, fill us with your spirit, with your power, with your love, that we may be effective witnesses on the earth for you. We declare an advancement of the kingdom of God and your agenda, God. I thank you for moments like this that you can speak to the areas of our life personally and impactfully. God, we honor you and we thank you. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray and all God's people said. Hey, can we put our hands together one more time?